we're part of a joint venture uh, here in New Zealand, but we're part of a much wider group. Uh, the BSS group uh, is based out of Perth in Western Australia. They grew out of the mining and construction industry out of WA. But they've grown um, and gone around the world. And I've just literally come back from Perth uh, yesterday and uh, talking with my colleagues around the world. Fatigue is our foundation deliverable, and it is a subject that perplexes many, but there is opportunity to take real advances in it. Today I want to pose and hopefully assist answer four questions for you. What is it? And how does it affect impairment? Why is fatigue of uh, such importance to uh, businesses today? What do we already know about fatigue in the construction industry apart from anecdotal? And what can your industry, construction in particular, do better to manage risk from employee fatigue? So hopefully, after 30, 35 minutes, um, we'll be on a journey where some of those uh, answers uh, are out here and, and we're talking about them. So the first question. Well, fatigue is essentially the loss of alertness and performance from essentially three things. Too little or, po or poor quality sleep. If there is a single answer to the issue of fatigue, it is around better quality and more sleep. Better quality and a greater quantity of sleep. Fatigue is also caused by working at times that we as human beings should be asleep. Uh, we are essentially, we've been drawn from the plains of Africa where we uh, lived and uh, tried to survive during the daylight, and so our bodies have essentially um, derived themselves for survival, and over time we are moving forward from um, daylight operations into naturally uh, night and 24-7 uh, operations. And the third aspect is, of course, is mentally and physically demanding work. And I put in there a little caveat regarding routine and cyclic work because um, not only does it often say when our employees call it boredom, but each cycle appears the same as previous, does cause fatigue on its own. So those are the three contributories. Fatigue is not just feeling sleepy. It's a, an acute ongoing state of tiredness and it, and it induces impairment, both physically and mentally. And it prevents people from functioning normally and safely and affecting their fitness for work. So the causes of impairment, uh, most of you would know this. I want to draw at it from a fatigue angle. So we've got fatigue is an input to impairment. And, of course, all of these others are inputs to impairment, but I can tell you that fatigue affects directly medical conditions, the use of caffeine and nicotine, it affects the use of illegal drugs, alcohol, the need for medication, the psychological factors such as mood, particularly anxiety and depression, and, of course, uh, that tough one, called stress. So it is both a permeable direct into impairment plus it affects the other variables as well. Fitness for work is essentially a process, a process that each organisation uh, can um, empower itself and enable into a workplace or site. The secret of good fitness for work is essentially the empowerment and therefore training and education of employees to change their behaviour and therefore change attitudes at work. And we can see that with alcohol and other drugs, fatigue, mental health 
and leadership development. Should that not work as well as it should, and in the early days that's how it will be, it then drops down into mates looking after mates, so peer management. Should that not work as well as it should, and it may not in the early days, it needs to drop down into supervisor and line manager capability. So those people need to be trained, and it's a different set of skills. It's a different set of skills around the algorithm, around how do you um, make a decision, how do you refer, what is case management, and do I have the soft skills for working in this area? And finally, at organisational level, having the ability to case manage a person who is now uh, declared unsafe for work and getting them back into work as soon as possible. Fitness for work assessments are required. So the major focus is on training to encourage self-responsibility and that every individual is aware of the duty of care. Are you all familiar with the phrase duty of care? For those of you uh, who perhaps aren't, duty of care is a responsibility that each of us have, whether we are employers or employees, to the safe conduct in the workplace. The second question. I want to talk about the new day. It's different than when I started work in 1970. We are working longer hours. Since great granddad started work, you and I are working on average a month longer a year. There's a global demand for products and services. We export across the world. For those of us who might be involved in the financial services part of business delivery, the markets open in New Zealand at 7 o'clock in the morning and they finish about 2 o'clock the following morning. There are people who are up early and long. For my children's generation, my, my kids are 25 plus, there's an innate desire to have it and have it now. My parents and my grandparents were comfortable waiting. And having it and having it now means that if I send a text, if I send an email, if I send anything in relation to a work which has an answer requirement to it, I expect it pretty quickly back. 70 hour weeks are not unusual. Six hour days, sorry, six day weeks are not unusual. And in your sector, possibly the new norm. Secondly, we want to use the other hours of the day for family and relaxation. There's only 24 hours in every day. Most of us know, Grandma told us, that we need to get eight hours sleep. That leaves 16 for work and life. Most people are robbing Peter to pay Paul. As a consequence, in our new life, we have night sport we have foodstuffs delivering to New World through the night. We have Z Energy delivering fuel to uh, gas stations overnight. The new day. Particularly evident here in Christchurch, but I've seen a lot, uh, having done a lot of work in WA, <coughs> of people who leave their home, their support structure environment, and go to work elsewhere. There's a price, and the price is the level of support. I do a lot of work in elite sport, and um, one of the big prices that elite sport is paying at the moment is for our Pacific Island community, who have got a huge investment, in, particularly in, in professional rugby, are paying the price of those very far now based characters 
playing rugby in France and Italy and in the UK, away from family and support, and there is a price. And we are seeing a lot more suicide in elite sport than ever before. Smart technology demands that we are always available. Ladies and gentlemen, we are becoming time poor. And there's a battle within. And that battle is within your body as it evolves. Let me talk about that. So we need a, in the 24 hour day, we need to be able to sleep for eight hours, therefore leaving 16. And our demand for time keeps drawing on the eight to extend the 16. Our body has natural cycles. The circadian rhythm prefers that we wake post-dawn and that we go to sleep in the early evening. And that there are dips of alertness during the post-afternoon period. That's why the Spaniards and the Mexicans have a siesta. And also in the pre-dawn, between around about 2 to 4 in the morning. The human body has changed from day to night. There are cycles happening in the body around body temperature, around the release of uh, melatonin, so that we can sleep. And so if we are continually trying to work when we should be asleep, and asleep when we should be um, awake, we are raging with the battle within. And we're all different. Each of us is different. Different ages, different sexes, come from different backgrounds. We have genetics uh, confounding the process. And so the best way to manage this is to manage it individually. There is no silver bullet. So three sets of statistics for you. Uh, first of all, statistic one. Don't know if you can read that very well at the back, but um, essentially, a lack of sleep activates your body's sympathetic nervous system. That's your f fight or flight response. Therefore, the body produces adrenaline, and it activates it to start storing fat reserves so that you need energy and release hormones that stop you from winding down at night. And so therefore, if you have less than seven hours sleep, you'll be gaining weight. And as a result of reduced sleep, you have reduced leptin production, and it increases your appetite. It's not just middle age. It's the lifestyles we lead and the work we do. Secondly, courtesy of the Centre for Sleep Research in the University of South Australia, um, looking at the w issue of impairment, drivers who have been awake for long periods of time performed on a par with drivers with alcohol and drug issues around alcohol. And it found that 18 hours of sleep was equivalent to 0.05 blood alcohol content. That's the Australian drink driving limit. And 20 hours, in fact, the uh, research is round about uh, somewhere between 20 and 22, 20 hours sleep for 0.08, the New Zealand drink driving standard. So think on that. And all of us and our kids have grown up knowing that 0.08 is a no-no when it comes to a work standard. The Australians, 0.05, and many, many uh, other uh, Western and other democracies around the world have a much lower drink driving standard. So poor sleep increases our susceptibility, and I've just defined poor sleep for the purposes of uh, looking at this. Less than six hours per night, often um, interdicted by insomnia. First of all, poor sleep increases our susceptibility to a 45% higher risk for cardiovascular disease, courtesy of uh, we are unable to control our weight, we have higher cholesterol or the wrong cholesterol, we have poor diets, some of us may smoke, we don't get enough exercise, 
for those of us that are more sedentary and we uh, live in a world of higher stress. So 45% higher cardiovascular. Secondly, obesity, courtesy of poor diet, uh, again, weight control and lack of exercise. And as a consequence, two and a half times higher risk for diabetes, particularly adult onset type 2. We all need to be able to measure, not necessarily our BMIs these days, it's our tum to bum ratio. Poor sleep also lowers our immune system. We have more colds, more flu, more headaches, and therefore a greater level of absenteeism and presenteeism in our workplaces. All familiar with presenteeism? That's where the lights are on, people are at work, but not a whole lot's happening. And this becomes even more so if you are an extended hours worker, as I know is happening a lot here in Christchurch, or if you're a shift worker. And poor sleep reduces our life expectancy, so the research says, by around about 12%. And for most of us, that'll be around about the eight or nine year mark. Now, I want those eight or nine years in my life, because I lost my dad early, and I don't want to be my kids saying the same thing. The average time of sleep per person per day in New Zealand, just looking at some composite research, is somewhere between five and six and a half hours. Way short of the ideal of somewhere around seven and a half to eight hours. We should be aiming for seven and a half. And I use the number seven and a half because a sleep cycle is 90 minutes long. And 90 minutes into seven and a half hours is five. We should be trying to aim for five complete sleep cycles per night as we sleep. We wake up much better refreshed for non-REM and dreaming sleep or REM sleep if we attain a full sleep cycle. 60% of adults in New Zealand, Australia and the US, so again this is uh, composite aggregated data, have a sleeping disorder and our next speaker is going to be talking a whole lot more about sleeping disorders. The big one of course, guys, guys, sleep apnea. If you're not sure what I mean by that, you need to put your hands around your neck and if you can't join your fingers in the back of your neck, you have what is known in medical, clinical terms as a fat neck. <laughs> and that is, in many cases, an early indicator, particularly for working men, for possibility of sleep apnea. More on that soon. Up to 50% of our population suffers from insomnia, and it's not only the sufferer, but it's also their partner. So often two people can cause uh, impairment in an employee, not just the individual, but also their partner adding to that issue. And I've lightly described uh, insomnia as I see it. Failing to sleep within 30 minutes after lights out and waking again and having trouble falling asleep again. There are various disorders relating to insomnia, more on that soon. I want to take you through a case study now that comes out of uh, Western Australia. It's only, um, it's only uh, uh, 15 months old. Um, for those of you who've either worked in this sector or have a, a feel for it, just tell me what this photo reveals. What stopped the haul truck from going over the edge into pit bottom? Sorry? The windrow? Certainly, the wind row in this particular case was slightly higher than uh, the uh, Western Australian Code of Practice standard. And secondly, what also stopped it? 200 tonnes in the tray. Because if the vehicle had been empty, what would have tipped the truck across the edge? The engine. The driver woke up with the vehicle swinging in the wind. 72 metres to pit bottom. So let's have a look at what WorkSafe Australia said in their notes. Don't know if you can read that, but um, this wasn't a bad fella. He was a good operator. 
a young man in his 30s, experienced, fit and healthy. And in general, he had been taking care of his fatigue. So how did it happen? Well, he prepared for his first night shift, having come off day. Uh, in mining, we talk about uh, pajama day, where people move, transition from day to night operations, and they are encouraged to have a sleep in the early afternoon of their middle day. On this particular occasion, he failed to have his sleep. He normally would have it. He then went to work at 6 p.m. He worked all night. Came home, had his breakfast, attended to a couple of things, went to bed. And he managed five hours sleep that day. He then went to work at 6 p.m., worked all night, came home, breakfast, attended to a couple of things, and then got six hours sleep. If we have eight as the ideal, he missed out on his three hours initially on his pajama day. He missed out on three hours in his first night change. Add those two together, that's six. And he missed out on two hours in his uh, day to two, to night two to three. That's eight hours of what we call sleep debt. Eight hours. Now here's what the WorkSafe investigator underlined in his report. There was accumulated sleep loss of approximately eight hours. Secondly, the accident happened just before daylight, which is a well-known time of the day recognised as the most difficult time to stay awake. And thirdly, the, at the time of the incident, the operator had been awake for continuously for 16 hours. The WorkSafe investigator concluded that fatigue was the primary cause of the accident. Fatigue impacts. Let's look at organisational first. There are generally four increased rates of incidents and accidents, including near misses. Loss of productivity, higher maintenance costs, higher levels of absenteeism, presenteeism and turnover. So those are the organisational costs and can be reasonably tracked. Secondly, employee impacts. Increased accident rates both at work and at home. Increased medical disorders, whether they're gastro or cardiovascular. Higher levels of stress and associated illness, particularly anxiety and depression. And higher rates of personal and relationship problems. People away from their natural support structures, living in camp or even travelling a great deal. Too tired to tend to the kids when they get back home. And as a consequence, people become very disaffected in their workplace environment. They're not disaffected with the employer at the outset, they just become disaffected because they're knackered. And they start blaming outsiders for things that they could easily fix if they only knew how. And there are four key misconceptions in, in the fatigue world. The first is that the issue can be effectively addressed by a focus on rosters and hours of work. That, that is an impact, but it is minimal. Secondly, the efforts to control fatigue should have as their primary focus the establishment of workplace systems. That is a misconception. Thirdly, that there will be a silver bullet and it will come along one day. It could be called a smart cap, it could be called all sorts of things. But they are only means to determine whether or not fatigue is present, not to reduce or manage it, and not to assist in sleep. And that you can manage fatigue by managing alertness. Caffeine is a well-known uh, strategy for managing alertness. It's a temporary means of getting through the problem. And one of the great issues around the use of managing alertness is that it masks fatigue in the longer term. So it's misplaced thinking because in two well-respected places, this is what those uh, researchers have determined. That the primary cause of fatigue is inadequate or poor, or poor quality sleep and that the effective management depends on an organisation's culture and the promotion of self-management rather than technology. 
and Dr. William Dement is one of the leading researchers from Stanford Medical. Signs of fatigue. Now the interesting thing here is, is that most of us would love to come to work always alert, but the new norm is we're somewhere around there. And if we go even further and look at the effects of sleep loss, most of us would love to come to work fully refreshed, particularly on a Monday morning, but the new normal, there, and even by Wednesday, here. So the variables that cause fatigue, there are many and varied. The left hand side is generally organisational fixes and the right hand side what the individual can do. So the brighter green, that which the individual can do and the lesser green, that which an organisation and an individual can do together. There is much that can be done. So what do we already know about the impact of fatigue within construction? Well, we don't have a lot of data yet. But I do want to give you an idea as to what can be done. Now, uh, this is a training manual. And in the back of it, because the book is two-thirds education and one-third assessments, is a, an assessment sheet. So 27 assessments. Individual fills it out. So we have data from energy, rail, mining and dairy. But only recently this year have we started to gather data on construction, and particularly construction here in Canterbury. Let me share that with you, as I know the company involved wishes me to. So individuals complete their individual fatigue profile, and we aggregate the data and present it back to the company. The whole purpose of the training is to train individuals, but we can also develop interventions for an organisation as well. So here is Fletcher's initial training results from um, mid-year, done here in Christchurch. Very, very small database. I just want to point a couple of things out to you. Noting that the database is quite small, but there are four interesting points. Straight away, you should alert to the fact that we use the traffic light system. So green means generally things are OK. Orange, a bit of a concern, but we can manage. And red, Let's deal with this and let's deal with it now. So the four areas that came up with Fletcher's were, how tired are you? Assessment number one. 100% of those people who involved in the training said that they were a medium or high risk. Next one. Assessment number six, insomnia. 65% of the people involved in the training said that they suffered from a high level of insomnia. Thirdly, assessment 11, sleep habits. People not necessarily having the tools to learn how to get to sleep and stay asleep. 100% of people said that they were medium and high risk. And fourthly, outside commitments. So people having a life, people having a lifestyle block, people travelling, people wishing to have a fish in the weekend, people going to rugby, looking, bringing after, picking up the kids, all that sort of thing. 41% said that they were high risk as a result of outside commitments. In other words, they were bringing additional fatigue back into the workplace from their days off. Now, I want to focus particularly on assessments one and six, so that's the uh, numbers 165 there, and I want you to benchmark those against international standards, uh, sorry, international uh, data out of Australia and South Africa. So the Fletcher's bar is on the bottom of each of these two. Assessment number one, tired employees, you can see that 29% uh, of the Fletcher's staff said that they were at high risk. That is a greater number than the um, numbers from Australia and South Africa. And that database out of Australia and South Africa is about 60,000 employees and growing. Assessment number six, insomnia. You can see that Fletcher's, which is the bottom bar, 65% um, of them were at high risk, and the 
general normal, well, the number that's uh, over time has reverted to 14. Now, some companies in Australia and South Africa start at the high number, but over time, uh, as a result of strategies and as a result of change, when they redo their assessments, uh, those numbers move. Tells a story, doesn't it? And of course, um, out of Australian research, 2011, um, fatigue has been identified as the number one concern of accident risk factors in construction. And the sample there was 253 construction employees, some safety supervisors and managers also. So, what can we do better? particularly for all construction. I mentioned uh, earlier about those two well-researched beliefs about self-management, and that implies that people, in order to become better self-managers, they need to be trained. They need to be trained in fatigue management and also sleep management. We're a training and consultation company. We use a manual. As I said, I've only got a couple of examples here. But it, we talk about it in the brochure that some of you, or most of you, have probably got on your table. And if you haven't got those in front of you or you've run out, Kate uh, might have some extras down her end. The information that exchanged, I've got three samples of the pages up here. One here on circadian rhythms and alertness. Next one on food, the right foods for staying alert and the right foods for getting to sleep. And thirdly, this big issue around Monday-itis. People who bring their fatigue to work. And it generally derives in a, a condition known as sleep inertia. The training style uses the VARC method. I'm not sure how familiar you are with it, but it's generally around seeing, hearing, and doing. And for working blokes, doing is good. Every hour, they stop, get up, do stuff, and they do a lot of assessments. Most people like to know where they sit in relation to their mates and, of course, some form of um, standard or some form of wider than me. That's what the assessments do. Six hours long. It can be tailored, but generally we find it works best in one hit. It's designed so that individuals can compare themselves against the traffic light standard, green, orange and red. And if they decide that they want to improve because they're having a crap time at home and they're on a final warning at work, they can conduct their own intervention and implement their customised fatigue management plan. If we've got time at the end, I'll show you how we do those interventions or how an individual can do them. Two other issues before I finish. The training helps supervisors also monitor fatigue. Whilst the training is principally focused on an individual, there is no doubt that supervisors can also assist their teams by monitoring fatigue. And I'm delighted to say that uh, Fletchers have decided to take what we call the Fitness for Work um, daily assessment and incorporate it into part of their standing operational procedures. It's essentially asking questions. I want you to think of it as it's a bit of a drug test for fatigue. How does an organisation and how do individuals know whether that guy or me is a risk to the business? In mining, we use it in pre-start, which is where the, the boss for the shift has got his folks, six, seven, eight, nine, ten people, all available for half an hour prior to hopping in their vehicles and going and doing the business. And the other matter is, really relates to sleep diary. Anyone that uh, brings up in training a red line issue, we generally invite them into uh, filling out a sleep diary so that we have got data and then we can assist them um, to work into a referral, whether it's a referral to a specialised sleep clinic, whether it's a referral to a district health board for um, a sleep assessment, and uh, if it's sleep apnea, um, the possible um, issuing of a controlled positive 
airway pressure machine to assist with breathing at night, or whether it might be working with an organisation like us to help with people with what we call CBTI, that is um, Cognitive Behavioural Therapy for Insomniacs. Started these programmes um, in both uh, the Bowen uh, Basin coal area in Queensland and also mainly in the iron ore in, in the Pilbara in WA. So that's really what I wanted to address this morning. <laughs>